Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Olya Marisic Kolores. I'm a pediatric nephrologist here. I thought we can get started. Thank you for everybody being uh, here in the camp building with us today and everybody joining on Zoom. Um, uh, we are going to get started with today's uh, Grand Rounds with a very special speaker who is uh, joining us from Children's University Hospital in Tübingen, Germany, Dr. Rupert Handgrettinger, who will be speaking on advances in immunotherapeutic strategies in pediatric cancer is actually here for our uh, best lecture series, hematology, oncology, and stem cell transplantation. I will like Dr. Britannia introduce him in more detail later. Um, first, um, just to draw your attention on the left to the text code where you can uh, confirm your attendance and then uh, later on with evaluations get credit and MOC part two credit if, if you fill out impressions from the meeting. Um, to draw your attention for, to the future grant rounds, Coming up on February 6th is Elena Shi from uh, University of Colorado and will be speaking on mechanisms of uh, inborn errors of immunity in IBD. And then on February 13th, um, Dr. Grace Lee will uh, present in our quality improvement series. As always, we want to uh, acknowledge Stanford University um, land acknowledgement, where we recognize that Stanford uh, sits on the ancestral land of the Moetma Ohlone tribe. Uh, moving forward, another reminder uh, is the California Maternal uh, and uh, Perinatal uh, Quality uh, Care Collaborative uh, meeting that will be on February 5th. This will be combining person and online and we'll be addressing perinatal health equity. So um, uh, it will be either uh, here in the CAM building or Zoom. So please join on February 5th. Um, another program that uh, we uh, want everybody to participate, if possible, is the Pediatric Interim Program at Stanford. We are now um, calling for mentors. So the uh, fifth is a six-week summer research internship for underrepresented in medicine, Bay Area high school students. And our goal is to show students the exciting world of science, research, and medicine. So um, uh, uh, on the bottom left is the ways to contact us if you would like to volunteer to mentor in this program. Um, and now uh, back to um, our uh, lecture today in advances in immunotherapeutic strategies in pediatric cancer. It is my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Alice Bertania. Um, who is the co-director of the Bass Center for uh, Pediatric Cancer, but also the chief of our stem cell program here at LPCH. And I just recently learned that uh, some years ago, she joined us from Bambino Gesù in Rome and um, impressive to have transitioned your knowledge in, from Italy to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It is really my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce today for our pediatric grand rounds, uh, Rupert and Grettinger. Rupert uh, wouldn't really need the presentation because uh, his name um, is quite uh, a star into the, into the field. I have been lucky enough to meet him uh, back in 2010 when I was in Rome and when I first started to do alpha beta T cell depletion. I always admired his um, his figure, um, his ability of really combining deep knowledge for this field and the passion for our patients that he never, uh, he never put aside. Um, his career has been um, incredible. Uh, he trained uh, at the hospital of Tübingen in, in Germany in uh, hematology and oncology. Uh, and uh, between 2000 and 2005, he served as the director of the division of stem cell transplantation at St. Jude here in the, in the US. Uh, then he went back uh, to Germany uh, where he was chairman of the department of pediatrics and hematology oncology at the children's uh, hospital in, uh, in Tübingen. Currently, he's a president emeritus uh, at the University of Tübingen and uh, he serves as a consultant uh, for the Abu Dhabi Stem Cell Center. Um, he has written uh, hundreds of peer-reviewed manuscripts that really made part of the history of stem cell transplantation and the hematology oncology. He's a member of the German National Academy of Sciences uh, Leopoldina. 
uh, and he recently achieved, achieved the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from the American Society uh, of Transplant and Cell Therapy, really as a recognition of his contribution uh, to the field. It is a great honor to have you here, Rupert. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alicia, for these kind words. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss with you a little bit about uh, the advances in pediatric immunotherapy. <clears throat> this is my disclosure. And a little bit back what Alicia already mentioned, I started my career at the old hospital in Tübingen. The former professor head was Professor Bethke. Maybe some of you know Professor Bethke, at least by name, the Beihauer, the Kleihauer Bethke test, of course, very important. But not only that was done in, uh, in Tübingen, there were some other achievements, and some of you don't know where Tübingen is. Maybe you know the cars, they are produced near Tübingen in Stuttgart. But Tübingen is a little city near the Black Forest, it's a university city. There are 80,000 inhabitants, but 30,000 students. So every third or fourth person you meet in the city is a student, which makes it very nice and academic. It's a big campus. So what has been achieved in Tübingen? It was founded very early in 4077, uh, for, uh, in 1477, had the first university hospital. That was very unusual. And you see some of the famous people who were their students. You see the Pope was there on the faculty, the Catholic faculty. I know whether somebody recognizes this gentleman. This Alois Alzheimer, he was also there for a while. And the castle kitchen in Tübingen is the most important castle, I think, or was the most important castle of the world, not because they cooked there. Uh, this is shown here. This was the castle. It was made a laboratory, uh, as you can see here, the laboratory of Professor F uh, Felix Hoppe Seiler uh, in, in about uh, one, uh, 1870. Who has heard the name Hoppe Seiler? Well, not that many. This was Felix Hoppe Seiler, and what he found, he found a hemoglobin, the first. He published in 1864 that he could crystallize the blood and named it hemoglobin, and he found out that this carries oxygen. So this is all uh, actually done there, but in the same lab, there was another guy working. This is this guy, his name is Friedrich Miescher. He was a guest doctor from, from Switzerland, and he worked in the same lab. And no one has ever heard of Dr. Miescher. Fortunately not. He was the one who purified the DNA first in 1869. He was the first, uh, and he named it, he called it nucleic acid, because he had the acid substance purified from wound. And this is still there, this uh, white uh, pulver you see there, they recently analyzed it again. There's a little museum now, it contains DNA and RNA. And then it was forgotten for almost 100 years, of course, like a, a lot of things in medicine. So there are a lot of things going on there, and then, of course, immunotherapy, and we all think this was the beginning of immunotherapy of cancer, and we know kool toxin here in the U.S., uh, where they injected bacteria into locally into tumors, and they saw some responses. Of course, then uh, at that time, that was at the, what is now called the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, I think in the New York Hospital, they did this. And then when James Ewing came, he was head of the department. He was a radiologist, a, a, a radiation oncologist. Uh, uh, Dr. Cooley was not allowed to do this anymore. So very similar politics there, like sometimes today, still going on. But uh, he was not the first also. There was this Professor Bruns. He published in German. This is, of course, at that time, all in German. He published the efficacy of erysipelas on tumors, and he injected this streptococcus, so induced erysipelas in tumors, and they saw five responses by this inflammatory reaction, which they cause fever reactions, local reaction, and Professor Bruns was also head of surgery in Tübingen, as you can see at that time, a little bit in another outfit, of course. <laughs> So a lot uh, was, was being done there, and then came the discovery also that RNA also carries genetic information in 1956. That was not so clear at that moment what RNA is doing. Of course, we knew from the Wilson Crick that DNA maybe uh, that is the genetic information 
DNA was not known. And now comes that's at the moment a big discussion, of course, who discovered first that uh, from D and from you can make mRNA vaccines. There is still an ongoing struggle. The first publication came from, from Ingmar Har, who was a, a student after of Professor Ramense in the immunology department. And they published first that injected RNA is transcribed into a protein in which they injected it into mice. And then they started this CureVac, which were not so successful in the race for the, for the COVID-19. This is Ingmar. And uh, biotech was found later. So now they quarrel a little bit who was the first and the usual patent issues. I don't know where this stands, but the science uh, is, is good. And then we know that from DNA to RNA to protein, and this is what we use also for tumor treatment. And I show you why. You know that every uh, protein, every whatever comes into a cell, is it a protein, a virus, is, uh, <coughs> is, uh, 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 is produced to small peptides. Everything what a cell incorporates is produced to, to small peptides, and these peptides are then presented uh, to, uh, in the, uh, from the presenting antigens to the via the HLA class one for CD8 T cells or via the HLA class two to CD4 T cells, uh, <clears throat> and this happens with any other substances which goes into a cell. It's it's presented to see for the body is it foreign or is it my is it or is it my own, and this is how it looks like. Then uh, this is presented to the T cell receiver, and it must be a complete fit. There cannot be one amino acid difference, otherwise the T cell receptor would not recognize that peptide. And this is something what also was, was has been found out in the 90s by Professor Ramensey, who was the head of immunology. He's now just also retired last year. And they found exactly out how these HLA peptides are presented in the, uh, in the HLA groove or the, in the HLA context. They identified these anchor positions, how, the, how they interact with the HLA, because this is very important if you want to use peptides for vaccination. They have to fit exactly in this uh, in this groove. There can be no error, otherwise it will not work. Especially anchor positions, the amino acid sequence of these peptides are very important. And this is what they use or what we use now to uh, start tumor vaccination. And for example, we take a tumor, this is healthy, healthy tumor and a tumor in the kidney, for example, from a patient after surgery. Then this tumor is sequenced, the normal cells are sequenced, the tumor cells are sequenced, and then we look for self-peptides and we look for tumor-specific peptides, either uh, for class one, this is peptides uh, uh, based on nine or 10 amino acids uh, size, or for class two, it can be 12 up to 15 uh, peptides. And each individual <coughs> patient has its individual peptides, of course. This is a very, <coughs> excuse me, a very spa uh, patient-specific approach and uh, this is one example <clears throat> in one patient with a primary metastatic tumor as you can see here this is the wild type this is the wild type and this is the mutated peptide and you can see there is only one amino acid difference and this is already enough for the immune for the immune system to recognize this as as uh, different as non uh, uh, belonging to the body and the T cells would be activated and fight this tumor based on this single amino acid difference. So the immune system is sensitive enough to recognize that this is not a cell which belongs to this body based on this one single amino acid uh, difference. And this is also, of course, with the other peptide, you always look for peptides where you have these differences. So it's a, and then you can synthesize these peptides. Uh, this is not that difficult to do chemically. And then you can uh, vaccinate a patient with these peptides. Uh, you choose for the best peptides, which uh, the algorithm which would, would fit, fit best in the groove. This must also, uh, of course, be there. And uh, it's HLA specific. You have to know the HLA type because every immune response is based on the HLA type of your patient. And then you find out the best peptides of those, and then you try to immunize the patient and see whether he mounts an uh, immune response. And this is, of course, for every patient different. There is almost no off-the-shelf tumor vaccine. That this works uh, has been shown by us and also others. This is a case report some years ago. <clears throat> this was a patient who had a 
metastasized relapsed pancreatic ductal carcinoma, which is normally a death sentence, as we, I think we know, a relapsed metastasized pancreatic cancer. And he got uh, uh, these peptide vaccines. Uh, the details are shown here. And this peptide lived many, many years. He had a very good immune response. We could monitor his CD4, CD8 response. And those patients who mount a very good immune response, they have a very good chance that they can control their tumor. <clears throat> this is another example just recently published that was a patient with a, with a, a fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. This was a young lady. She was 16 when she came to us and the tumor was not uh, surgically removable, removable. So she had, a, she had a liver transplant for this, but then she had a metastasis outside the transplanted liver of the tumor, uh, and which could not be really addressed by anything. So she also went into this uh, vaccination program. And here we have this uh, fusion uh, protein. And if you have a fusion protein, your chance is very high that you find peptides from these fusion proteins, which are only for the tumor because it's a tumor specific fusion protein. So you only have to look in the fusion protein for peptides, not in the whole tumor, to see differences and to find the appropriate peptides. And as you can see here, this was the patient. She had a liver transplant, then she had some chemotherapy, then she had up to four relapses. You know? And then we did this uh, two vaccines with this. Uh, uh, peptides adjusted to this fusion protein, fusion protein she has. And as you can see here, she mounted a very, very good T cell response. Also, also here, uh, this, is the, this is the T cell response and she responded very well to this. And uh, this is her pet uh, before. You know, she had this lesion here, which even could not be removed. And this is the, the pet imaging. And it's completely uh, dissolved by this uh, T cell expansion of the of the tumors uh, of the tumor specific uh, T cells, and she's still in remission as we speak. So it's still done. Once you get these T cells ongoing, or we can repeat the vaccination. This is something, of course, we have to still figure out. And based on these results, we have now an ongoing phase one, two trial. Uh, for patients, uh, for pediatric patients and IR patients with metastasized fusion-driven sarcomas. If you have a fusion, it's much easier to find the peptides. Fly one, U e w one or Ewing or some Raptor have, uh, you know, they have all these fusion uh, uh, protein, fusion uh, oncogenes. So it's easier to find specific peptides. And this is now an ongoing study. First patients have been. Uh, um, uh, included already, so we and it's a safe therapy. This has actually no side effects. Uh, uh, this vaccination, this is, uh, and and it can be effective if you can expand somehow these T cells. But then in, in adults, in, in adults, you know, monoclonal antibodies play a big role. Rituximab and all this, uh, but in children, the question is, does do they also play a big role in children? And monoclonal antibodies have a lot of actions. Uh, one of them is, of course, this antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity with na natural killer cells, some with macrophages, and also the complement-mediated uh, lysis. <laughs> and also, it, uh, overall, they can be used to target tumor cells, either tumor microenvironment or tumor targets. And the question is, do they play a role in pediatrics? And I think the best example is, and maybe you know, and you know this example, is neuroblastoma, where we had this murine 14 G2A antibody made by Professor Reinsfeld at, uh, at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, who originally also came from Stuttgart near Tübingen. And uh, <clears throat> he made this monoclonal antibody against the DCLO ganglioside GD2, which is highly expressed on the pediatric neuroblastoma, a very nasty tumor in young children uh, with, with a not so good prognosis. <clears throat> and we treated this, uh, we did a phase one, a phase study very early in the 90s with this Muran antibody. I have to say there were not yet all these regulations as we uh, have today. So at that time, this was in the early 90s, this would not have been possible probably to do this, but Professor Reisfeld was very open to give us this antibody. So we treated this patient in Germany. This was a patient, a three-year-old patient, relapsed metastatic neuroblastoma. 
Then he had MIBG therapy, didn't respond. Then he even had a med sibling transplant. That was end of the 80s to do a med sibling transplant. And neuroblastoma was already a, a little bit something, but he relapsed again. So I asked Professor Reisfeld for the antibody and he was willing to give it to us. So we gave this uh, antibody to this patient and we reported in that paper that this patient is longer in remission now since 104 weeks. But they changed a little bit. This patient is still with us and is a pediatric oncologist now, by the way. So it, it can be effective. Uh, and then based on this, we uh, this is Ralph Reisfeld. I think we own him a lot in the pediatric field. And you see all his, uh, he, uh, he was a mentor of many of us, including James Allison, the Nobel Prize laureate, was, uh, was working as PhD in Ralph's lab. And you see a lot Alice Yu, who led the uh, also the, the, the randomized study here. So you see a lot of people and I think that was, and he unfortunately passed away in 2021. And all this antibodies based on this uh, Ralph Reisfeld uh, achievement, the uh, 14G28, a murine antibody, then Steve Gillis also worked with Ralph, made the CH1418 antibody, which is nowadays known as dinotuximab which is now approved after 30 years of work in pediatrics for the treatment of uh, refractory neuroblastoma. And Steve also made this U1418 K322A antibody, which is a humanized version, a little bit different from the other ones. And uh, as you know, probably all know the paper, the uh, pivotal paper from Alice Yu, done here in the US, the randomized uh, study with a uh, neuroblastoma where they randomized standard chemotherapy uh, versus uh, immunotherapy with this GD2 antibody, a little bit different approach with the, how they produce the antibody. And that led to the uh, earlier end of the study uh, because the immunotherapy was so successful, as you can see here, the event-free survival and the overall survival, and that led to the approval of the dinotuximab. And now, of course, uh, it has become very expensive therapy, unfortunately. So we have also to work on this, how we can make this antibody available to other patients outside, uh, let's say, the high-income countries. Uh, and this is something we, has, we have also to think about. So this antibody was then very successful. And the St. Jude, uh, St. Jude uh, they, do, they do a similar study or have done a similar study with this antibody, with the U14K3228. It's a little bit different uh, uh, antibody. This antibody has a reduced complement binding activity, so it does not cause this much pain by complement activation like the CH1418. So you can give higher doses. And St. Jude is using now this antibody successfully in combination with chemotherapy, like ARCHOP now. They do in adults, they use antibody plus chemo, in lymphomas. So now we do it very similar in neuroblastoma that we use together with the chemo, we use the antibody, which makes maybe the, the cells more susceptible to chemo or the immune system, the inflammation, we don't know yet. But, uh, and then this patient go to a transplant and then they get all, also post-transplant, if they still have minimal residual disease, this antibody as a, like a maintenance therapy. I think this is also something very interesting in the future to combine immunotherapy with chemotherapy. Uh, and this is their published results, recently published, uh, that uh, in the, this is frontline therapy. So they see a very good uh, response also of the tumor size if they combine their, if they combine their uh, chemotherapy with this uh, antibody uh, treatment. And uh, we have just recently published our results. We have done a large study in Tübingen and in, in Germany uh, with Tübingen as the, as the study center, where we did a similar approach, but these were patients who all relapsed after autologous transplantation. So they had a relapsed refractory neuroblastoma. They underwent already the standard approach, chemotherapy, autologous transplantation, and then they relapse. And we know still about 50% of our patients relapse after our standard therapy. And then the prognosis is not very good of this patient. So we thought we need to do also a different approach. So what we did, we gave them a haploid transplantation, of course, T-cell depleted. That's why 
in order to change the immune system of the patient, just to give them a new immune system and then activate this immune system with this antibody uh, up, to, up to nine cycles of the GD2 antibody, the dinotuximab beta, which I have shown you. And we have done this study from 2010 to 2017. Uh, so we have a long follow-up in 68 patients, which has published our results. And if the patients, this is shown here, if the patients are in a CR when they come to the Haplo or to the antibody treatment or in a good PR, they still have now a survival long-term seven year uh, follow-up of about 50%. And this is for refractory relapse neuroblastoma. I think this very good data. And uh, I think this will also uh, maybe has to be ex expanded more uh, into, into immune approaches. You can see that the immune system is important. And here, of course, we try to give the patient a new immune system because uh, we have seen that when these patients had six, eight cy cycles chemotherapy, a heterotologous transplant, their immune system is just not working anymore. You cannot expect a lot. You see this also when we, when we want to produce CAR T cells from some patients who had endless chemotherapy. It's just not working very well. So can we do the same in acute lymphoblastic leukemia? There's a nice uh, overview on immunotherapy. And of course, one of the most important antigen is CD19. You know this all from the CAR T cells, but it's not all about only CAR T cells. It's just about all, maybe only a simple monoclonal antibody. And we have generated, uh, or immunologists have generated an anti-CD2, anti-CD19 antibody. And this antibody has two amino acid changes here. And uh, this makes this antibody very active to enhance this antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So if you incubate this antibody with natural killer cells, like on this side, uh, and then uh, uh, against leukemic blast, you can see the, in the NK cells get mu very much activated through the FC receptor, which activates NK cells by the FC binding part. And when they have this, uh, this, uh, this mutation in the CH2 domain, uh, this red one, the ADSCC is much more effective. And uh, we have used this antibody that was a, a first uh, result in, in, in one patient, also one of these patients as a compassionate use. This patient also had a, had a, very, had a relapse after matched unrelated transplant, and then he never went into remission. You can see here, this was his MRD by flow and by PCR, so we did both. And then we did a haplo transplant on this patient here, alpha beta depleted, difficult with the mouse here. We did a haplo transplant, and then, of course, these patients have a high risk of relapse when you do a transplant when they are not in remission, we know that. And then we gave him for two years, we gave him this CD19 antibody. Every two weeks, we gave him a dose of antibody outpatient. After one year, we wanted to stop, but then was very interesting. The parents refused to stop huh? because they know this is the last chance. So we did in the second year, we did every four weeks, <laughs> but without big scientific uh, foundation. But you can see the, of course, what's going on in this, in these families, of course. And uh, fortunately, this patient is still in remission now as we speak. So based on this, it's still now more than eight years and almost no side effects with these infusions. No, this is an outpatient infusion. And then we did a, a, more, a more clinical study. Uh, so we treated uh, 15 patients and uh, 11 patients relapsed after a first transplant and got a haploidentical transplant. So the second transplant is only haploidentical because it's experimental. We don't do an experimental transplant with a mud transplant again. That only goes to haplo. Alpha beta depleted, of course. <laughs> and then this, and you have to, because if you want to have do post-transplant strategy, you cannot use immunosuppression afterwards. That's the and then uh, two, four patients even had a relapse after two matched unrelated transplant and got a third transplant, it's still possible. And then we treated these patients also with, uh, uh, with the monoclonal antibody for two years. And uh, of course, can see the probability of relapse. This is without, this is a historical control, not a randomized. This was the relapse when we only, only did haplotransplant. This was the risk of relapse when we, 
uh, when we gave the antibody for two years and the event-free survival was also much better for those patients who get the antibody. Of course, this is still something, uh, something we have to improve. The nice thing is, the, this is the overall, this is, this is the data I was looking. So this is the overall survival of our patients who received the, who received the, I shouldn't touch this. This is the overall survival of the patients who received the antibody dose without antibody, but not randomized. This was a historical control in the event-free survival. But you see, we have a number of long-term survivors. This is the relapse. And what's also interesting, these patients, uh, when we stop the antibody treatment, they recover their B cells, as you see on the right side. So all of them get their B cells back, and, uh, and uh, most of them, they stayed in remission. Based on this, we work now with this humanized anti-CD19 antibody, tafacitamab. The adult uh, colleagues might know it. It has been approved now for the treatment of uh, diffuse uh, large B cell lymphoma in adults in combination with this is also an optimized antibody, has also these two amino acids. Now the mouse is completely gone. Yeah, there's also these two amino acids, so to make it more effective and works with natural killer cells, this antibody dependent silo, cytotoxicity has some direct action or also can work with macrophages. And now we also initiated a study uh, with this antibody in Tübingen as the sponsor. So an IIT study where we now evaluate the role of this antibody in the setting of uh, refractory leukemia. So all patients now who get a second transplant will get this antibody for one year maintenance post-transplant. Or if they are MRD positive before transplant, they get the antibody, they get the transplant, but then you have one year the antibody afterwards. Or if they are MRD post-transplant positive, they will also get the antibody. Of course, if they do not respond by MRD, they will change to CARS or whatever is then available. So we have now finished the dose escalation. We know the dose is well tolerated. Uh, so, so far it looked promising, but of course we have to wait for the results. Then most of you have heard of the Blinatumumab. map. Of course, the, the hematologist, this is Professor Reed Miller, who also, unfortunately also passed away uh, last, last year. He developed the anti-CD3, uh, uh, CD19 bispecific antibody uh, where, we, where he fused the CD19 anti antigen binding site with the CD3 antigen binding site to this, uh, to this bite. This, uh, <clears throat> and this upon binding to the, to the CD19 target, the T cells get activated and that can be very effective. And uh, we started the first patient in 2008. That was also a patient with us in Tübingen. That was a patient, a uh, seven year old boy with refractory relapse after mud transplant. And this is all the therapy. He got one chemo after another. And you see by flow cytometry, PCR here, he did not respond to anything. So then the parents were asking, they, they were both colleagues. I came to Tübingen, what, what can we do? And I heard of Professor Rittmüller. I knew him because he was former on the faculty in Tübingen, in the colleges before he went to Munich. So I called him with a, I heard about his bispecific and he gave it to us. That was no Amgen involved yet, that came all later. That was called MT103. So we gave this patient this antibody, really didn't believe that it will work. After two weeks, it's a four week infusion. After two weeks, the patient was MRD negative. It was, for us, it was a miracle. And then, of course, we did a second haplotransplant, transplant, and this patient is now a lawyer also. So he might sue me because <laughs> we did an unapproved uh, therapy. So he's, yeah, yeah, he's now so also interesting. So he's, he's, he, he made it through. And then we did some more patients, and out of this compassionate use then, still under MT103, and we see a lot of uh, complete responses. And in two patients, we also learned something we had two patients here who started with a, with a two. Oh, yeah, maybe. These were two patients who started with very high blast load and it didn't work. Normally you say, oh, this is not working, but the, the parents begged us, try it again, try it again, please. 
So we gave this patient a chemotherapy again just to stop their progression and tried it again. And then they have lower blast load and both went MRD negative. So we learned the blast uh, is important how you start. And that came later out, of course, in the studies. That was then the study which led to the approval of the blinatumumab. Uh, the first eligibility was more than 25 plus, but the follow-up study then, we had much a lower plus eligibility. We could even uh, use MRD for indication of blinatumumab. And that also gave us very good uh, responses. As you can see, MRD responds. Those patients who are treated in the MRD situation, they almost all respond. Uh, to MRD negativity. But the thing is, of course, uh, linatumumab does not induce any memory. What we want, like vaccination, we want a long memory, but linatumumab isn't do that. It will not do that. It says a short half-life. If you stop the infusion, the activity is gone the next day. That's why you have to give it as a 24-hour infusion for four weeks. So it's not something to, to maintain and you cannot give it forever. Because we have also, normally it was five cycles in the initial study. We have seen relapses after the third or fourth cycle during the tumor So nowadays, I wouldn't give more than two cycles and then go to the next step, either transplant or car or whatever you have. So it's not worthwhile, in my view, to give too many cycles because you might relapse still. Also CD19 positive. Very rarely CD19 negative, but also CD19 positive. And nowadays, of course, uh, blinatumumab is started also in frontline therapies. Uh, this is the, this was the intrial study, study where one chemotherapy in the relapse protocol was replaced by one uh, blinatumumab. This, this, this intensive chemo was replaced by blinatumumab and the patients were randomized and then went to, uh, to a transplant. And this was just recently published by, by Franco. Uh, uh, of course, and you can see the significant results. Those patients who got a blinatumumab instead of the intensive chemo, they did better uh, than patients in event-free survival and overall survival, and also uh, in the uh, risk of relapse also, as you can see here. So this is also something that we try now in pediatrics also maybe to go away a little bit from more chemotherapy and make it a little bit more smarter using immunotherapy or combinations to treat patients, because we know this, all these long-term side effects. I don't think we have to talk about uh, those, what we induce in these patients with, with uh, intensive chemotherapy, especially in younger children. They have done the same in the US, uh, uh, Pat Brown, uh, but their results were not so clear. They were maybe there was a tendency. They, had all, they have also replaced in their relapse protocol two chemocycles with blinatumumab. But I think this is the future a little bit now in the, that we go more frontline with this kind of immunotherapy. And in Germany, in Europe, uh, we try this with, with, the, with the Italian BFM protocol 2017 that we introduce here a randomized uh, two cycles of linatumumab instead of two cycles of high dose chemo and the patients who have a high risk uh, feature. This is not relapse, this is frontline now. Or in the intermediate risk, we give, uh, before the maintenance, we give one cycle of uh, linatumumab. So we have to wait the results. My gut feeling is that in the future, we will even go a little bit more earlier also here that we maybe replace some of this uh, some of this uh, chemotherapy for example maybe if we can get rid of of doxorubicin would be good for the hearts of our children or some of the asparaginase which is my view a horrible drug with all these side effects if we can replace some of these drugs with uh, immunotherapy and of course you have seen probably this data on infant uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, where blinatumumab was added to the chemotherapy and uh, pub was recently published in the New England Journal. And the results are just staggering. You see the current study, two-year survival, 80% versus 50%. And for the, for the disease-free survival and also the overall survival for, for infants. So this is now in the infant study also fixed protocol to use blinatumumab for infant ALI. That's, I think that's a huge progress for, for uh, lymphoplastic leukemia in infants. 
So then, of course, we have the chimeric antigen receptor. I think I don't have to talk too much about it. You have heard a lot of this probably here in, the, in this campus by, by, by your colleagues. Uh, just to show you the picture who had the idea of it. This, this is the same with the, with the DNA from Tübingen. He, he published this in 1990, and it was forgotten for about yeah, 20, 25 years. No, well, this is an artifact or something. Like, like all these things, nobody has worked with, with this Cartes as a boy. They were known a long time ago when he published it. I think people didn't believe him so really. And you all know the data then, of course, now it came, uh, the data which led to the approval of the, of the uh, Kimbraya, uh, the Eliana study with uh, the uh, event-free survival of about 50% in the overall survival. But to be honest, for us pediatrician, to be honest, 50% is not good, only 100% is good. So we have to work more. We cannot say, oh, we have a good therapy. If we have 100%, I would agree, but even 90 is not good enough for us, right? So we, we should not stop. But, and this is also, this was a study, and this is the real world data on, uh, on Kim Raya, the CISA gain Lacloid cell, and you still see a lot of CD19 negative relapses. So there is a problem also with this, uh, with this CD9, this target escape in CAR T cells. And if you have these relapses, the prognosis is not so good. These are not, not done on the studies now. Of course, on the study, everything is controlled. This is the real world data, which is probably the real data which you have to look at. So what can we do against, against the CD19 negative relapses? If the blasts are smart enough to just get rid of their targets, they cannot be seen by the CAR T cells anymore. And there are different methods or different uh, approaches how the tumor cells can do this. They either just lose, they have a receptor genetic mutation or whatever, whatsoever. They just get rid of this antigen. And there are several approaches. We have looked into this approach as a tandem approach where we use the 1922 car at the same time with one transaction. And of course, manufacturing with uh, companies is very expensive, so it takes very long. So we make them ourselves, but to do this here, I think on the campus also, you make the CAR T cells it's in, in six to 12 days, you have your cells ready. We don't freeze anymore. This is fresh in, fresh out. We don't freeze any of these cells. Uh, that's all gone. So these are all fresh cells. And we treated uh, initially some years ago already nine patients with the CD19 in 22, even adult patients. Uh, some patients had already a relapse after a transplant, what we call true pseudo allogeneic. They, they received the, the cars after the transplant, but the cars, the T cells were actually from the donor. Not donor car T cells, but from the patient, but donor derived. Uh, and uh, the transaction efficiency is very good. And this is uh, the patients. Again, all patients received this 3 million per kg of the CD1922. And this is the response. Uh, so six of them had a complete remission, as you can see here. Uh, and then, uh, so it worked quite nicely. And there was one patient I want to show you. This is, was an allogeneic patient. She had a completely refractory leukemia. This is her disease. She came from uh, outside, from, from Saudi Arabia to us. And she was very sick when she came because she had severe toxicity after conventional chemotherapy. She couldn't move. She was like in a coma. And then we took it took about half a year just to make her a little bit mobile with some low dose chemo so that she's not blasting off. And then we tried autologous CD1922 cars, didn't work, short response, but then she had again progress. And then we did another boost of the cars, no result, multiple chemos, partial response. She never went into remission for a whole year, never. And then we did a mud transplant on her with a matched unrelated donor. But which we normally don't do because you wouldn't do a, a transplant in a patient who is not in remission, especially like her. But we had the idea with the donor cells coming, uh, we made cars out of this. So what, what we did, so we transplanted this patient and she had uh, this residual macroscopic disease. We gave her the allogeneic donor cars and she cleared all the leukemia. She had a very nice expansion of her 
CD19 and CD22 cars. Uh, and this is the result. As you can see here, this was four weeks after transplant, and she had it not only there, she had it the whole body, bone marrow, lymphomas, it was all full. Then she had even a progression after, tra after transplant, and then she got the donor cast, and since then, four weeks after donor cast, she's, she's cleared completely in remission. We, I just visited her uh, a few weeks ago in Saudi Arabia. So the colleagues there, they're, they're measuring her CAR T cells. She still has 25% CAR T cells after three years. That keeps her in remission. So this is something we need to achieve. But we don't know why is in this patient 25% in some patients, they disappear after a few weeks. So there is still, I think, a lot uh, we have to learn. So we need also new CAR models. <laughs> So what are new CAR models? And this is also what we published and we work together with a uh, Milton company on it uh, that we make not a car against a tumor target, we make a car against an adapter. And then this adapter is labeled to the antibody. So we make a car, this is the normal car, goes directly to the target cell. This is the, this is the car goes against an adapter and this adapter is labeled to the antibody. So if you remove the antibody, the car is not active because this car is, in, in our case, it's biotin, it's a biotin car, uh, doesn't recognize anything. It's not a human biotin, it's the one you use for biotinylation in the lab or something. Uh, so you can stop the car anytime, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt you. And this is quite effective, as good as with the, with the direct car. This is a model for CD20. You can see here that this is uh, the car alone, doesn't do anything because he doesn't recognize. This is uh, with the rituximab and this is the CD20 car and this is our art car. So we get very good results. And why are we doing this? Because this is, I think, a little bit for the future because we, can, we are now very flexible to use maybe even two or three antibody and targets at the same car, at the same time, only one car. Of course, we are trying whether we get other, other adapters. There is still a lot of research, but I think this is something we can combine, you know, also a, a little bit specific to the patient. Has the patient a lot of CD20? Maybe you add it, but maybe not so much 22. Maybe you use another panel. So, and the same is uh, for AML. Of course, the, our goal is AML <clears throat> because we can stop we can, we can uh, treat a patient, even if his myeloquosis goes down, we just withhold the adapter. The cars alone don't do anything. You can, you can re have the hematopoiesis recovered. And this is now what we are uh, trying and the first clinical uh, trials will hopefully start even in the next months. Uh, so my conclusions are, I think tumor vaccination will become, I think, a first pillar of cancer therapy, especially for solid cancer, especially those with this fusion oncogenes where we have very good targets and effective targets. I think monoclonal antibodies, of course, now CAR is all over, but don't forget the monoclonal antibodies. They can be very effective. I, I would not uh, put them uh, off yet. Uh, I think these specific antibodies are a bridge to transplant. I think uh, I, I would say they are induced long-term remissions because the memory is missing. I think CAR T cells will become a standard frontline therapy in our in in, in the leukemia, uh, and I think it should. And I think it might also replace transplant in some of the patients if we find out. I personally think if we do CAR T cells uh, in very high risk patient, I would go to donor CAR T cells because of the long persistence uh, and also the healthy immune system we are dealing with. It's the same with the neuroblastoma uh, patients where we induce a new immune system, not, not to give the patient more chemotherapy. This is not the idea of our haplotransplant patient had already, just to give them a new immune system, which might better control the tumor. And I think, of course, the new CAR models should also be evaluated uh, to avoid target negative relapse. And there's still a lot to do. And of course, you are on the best track here in Stanford also to do these things. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rupert, for this beautiful lecture. Uh, I'm looking around to see if they have, there is uh, any uh, question from the from the audience. Yeah. So in the post transplant, yeah. the anti-CD9 are. How do you think about the long T cell 
I, I, I would hate to see visa recovery, to be honest. Hmm? Even in the post-transplant Exactly, in the post-transplant setting. That means my cars are still there and active. I can deal with a B cell deficiency. This is, I, not, I cannot deal with a progressive refractory leukemia, but I think with a B cell deficiency, this patient is on a four weekly immune globulin maintenance and she still needs it. But I think, uh, so if you have to choose between, you know, huh? so, but, but there are some patients, of course, who recover B cells, that's our biological marker now. But if they recover B cells, you better look very closely on your MRD, better NGS MRD, what you see. Hmm? So I think this is something, I, I rather have the B-cell de deficiency. Hmm? Robbie. Oh, so the question looking at this is, what's the relative thing of, as a variation of Matt's question, of the antibody versus fit? And the question is, how do you resolve in a post-transplant setting? Which of those is a better way the, approach, uh, yeah. the antibodies versus versus the bit the specific. after after transplant yeah. of course you can you can uh, also which is hmm? which is uh, we don't know we, the, we, the study is ongoing the antibody uh, is easier because it's an outpatient uh, every two or three weeks infusion not at 24 our four week continuous infusion, I think the antibody is very effective, but we have to, we have to wait the studies. Plinatumumab is also effective for transplant, but if it's very cumbersome to give it at the moment, at least until they come up with another, maybe device or subcutaneous or something. And, and if they are very T cell lymphopenic, uh, early post transplant might not have enough uh, T cell to engage. Also, so that might be another factor. So the to antibody consider. uses in K cells can do macrophage ADCC, uh, works partially via complement. You can also modify the antibodies to activate complement. And this is why I, I'm still thinking, but of course, nowadays, the murin antibody, which we had originally from Ralph, was our best antibody we ever had because that was the best complement mediator. And we measured that in our paper, which we published there, we measured anaphylatoxins, C3A and C5A. Half an hour after the infusion, these things went up and the complement was activated. And complement is very effective in killing or making holes into cancer cells. But this is through this engineering and humanizing, this is all a little bit lost. It also makes the pain, is the complement. So there is, uh, but I think nowadays to go back to murine antibodies would almost be a sacrilege or something. <laughs> but I, in my feeling, they were, they were still very effective. Hmm? <laughs> Thank you again. We have a little um, gift for you as a memory of oh. this um, endowed lectureship. So. Oh, thank you. That back with you. Okay. I hope that will be a good memory for the future. I'm sure it will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.